pediatric work, I just thought I'll introduce pediatric ophthalmology as slightly separate from adult ophthalmology for two reasons. Is that uh, the pediatric age group has a different ocular pathology which is so unique to them and the growing eye behaves differently than a grown eye or an adult eye. So uh, the need to separate that out and do it slightly differently than the adult. But why get into all this in the first place? I mean, what's the big deal? It's just an uh, eye. So as we were looking at what is childhood blindness like in India, I don't want to really run through big numbers. I've chosen uh, just a few numbers just to highlight where we are. We have a huge pediatric population and this uh, 386 million children is also not of last year, a little less so, more than this. And from that more than uh, 3 lakh children are blind and more than 80 million are visually impaired. Now all of this data for a country like India is probably normal. X million have so many diseases. But I think the last line on this slide is the most important. 50% of these are treatable or preventable. Okay. So this is the point that I want to make is, yes, we have huge numbers, but 50%, that's a lot, are preventable and treatable to be brought out of the area of visually impaired. Go ahead, Dr. Maniar, you wanted to ask. Yeah, Sorry, yes, I just wanted to ask an uh, opinion about what do you think are the common causes from the audience uh, and then Dr. Nipa can continue. Please. Okay. So in, uh, are you going to read out the question, Dr. Maniar? Uh, it, uh, everybody can read it, so I generally don't okay. waste time in doing that. Okay. But I would read. In, in their opinion, what is the commonest cause of visual impairment in children? Correct. Okay, so this is the divided house. Uh, Dr. Deepa, your call. Okay. So, fortunately, those, so both those answers were very interesting. Except, uh, fortunately, now, I'm going to say refractive errors is the most common single cause of treatable uh, visual impairment. Fortunately, the vitamin A deficiency is reducing, maybe because, and I have seen this myself, worked with Anganwadi workers, and I'm only talking, I'm sorry, but I'm only talking about urban population. That's how much my experience has been. But I've actually worked with the Anganwadi workers and stuff, and they are very good about supplementing vitamin A. So, and family like uh, families like ours usually take care of what the children eat. So, fortunately, we are not seeing too much of vitamin A deficiency nowadays. So, I would both answers are correct, but now refractive errors is the most. So, now since we don't have a national database. Uh, it's usually, if you pick up the papers, we usually have regional or divisional uh, data. And so we thought we'll do our own stuff and see where we stand. But uh, this data may be slightly skewed because it's urban India and Mumbai. So I don't want to say it represents the country. So we did our own little um, program. We called it the Mumbai Childhood Blindness Program. And we looked at more than a lakh children. And uh, as your answer says 55% were uh, uncorrected, but fortunately treatable refractive errors. And a small group, 5% had amblyopia. Now, 5% is more compared to some other countries. But, um, yeah, so usually the amblyopia rate is between 2 to 3.5%, as was a little high. Okay, so this was why we are doing pediatric ophthalmology and what is our backlog and what we need to cover up. Now coming to what the normal visual milestones are. 
so what do we all look for when we see a child and what should we expect in a normal child at birth you should expect a blink reflex to bright light now i want to say that if you go into the uh, well baby nursery and look at each child with a bright light you may not always get a consistent response yeah but most children will have a uh, reflex to bright light at some point in the first 6 to 8 weeks the child will start fixing on usually the mother's face or a human face and by about 2 to 2 and a half months will follow that face or follow the object by 4 to 6 months the child will find the object and try to reach for it or if you present two objects can move fixation between the two and by 6 months by and large you, you know you get a decent range or a decent range of visual field so you present objects not just in the center slightly off and you'll still be able to grab it by about 5 months you get a decent level of muscle imbalance uh, sorry a muscle balance so what do i mean by that what i mean by that is if there is a muscle imbalance or a small squint most of the time we wait till 6 months of age to see if the muscle balance recorrects before doing something of course the earlier the squint as is seen in the first few weeks after life which we actually say call it a congenital squint and i would react sooner but by and large we wait for 6 months for muscle balance to be attained now all these were visual responses in a younger child as the child grows we feel the need to actually record vision or have a sense of how much the child can see quantitate it and i've just shown a picture of the different vision assessment charts that we have in our clinic if i have to uh, the younger the child we use these gratings these are paddles it's just it's called a lia paddle if you see here where my arrow is pointing the thicker gratings is what the child will easily be able to see and these gray ones that you see are not really gray the picture is not good they are very fine gratings so depending on how fine a grating the child picks up is how the vision is assessed and as they grow older here you can see these are pictures so these are pictures that they are able to identify before they come to letters so these are picture charts for the very small ones these grating charts are these are lia paddles and uh, these are cardips till about 2 to 3 years of age and then the older ones do pictures now sorry so if i go back this lia paddle costs a lakh this one costs 60 some thousand k pictures cost 30 we being uh, poor at lotus eye hospital we have a college of optometry so we made our own chart we made about 60 70 symbols and uh, you know we had to verify them which one has what visual resolution and whatever else that it takes and we have made this chart it is available for 600 rupees so uh, we validated it we presented it at the world congress and it's being used um, by people like us can i ask a question here please yes so i just wanted to ask uh, visual acuity should be tested in each eye separately or one can do it with both eyes open i wanted the audience to interact on that i'm sorry if you find some of these questions very silly or basic but it's good to be clear on what we can or we cannot do it's a good question actually because in everyday life we use our two eyes together 
Really. Yeah, and sometimes we in a hurry in a clinic we may want to. Sorry. So this is a result which we have got, uh, Dr. Nipa. Your comments on that. Excellent response, because that is absolutely what we recommend. We recommend that we should record vision monocularly, which means with each eye. Because 25% of the times we have something called as an isometropia, which means different visual statuses in each eye, which is a clear stimulus to unilateral amblyopia or one eye being weaker than the other. Sometimes it's very difficult to cover one eye. The child doesn't like it. The mother's hand is one thing that we use, sometimes a plastic cover, sometimes a patch. And if you don't get vision, you try again after half an hour. You don't get, you try again or just call the patient back the next day. Sometimes it takes, I have had the long, uh, the la, well, maximum number of times that I have tried before getting anywhere is nine times just to see if vision has been equal in both eyes. Anyway, so we, our students make these kind of um, little things to make it more attractive. This is made by our fellow. This is just something stuck on the trial frame. And you know, we let them choose how they want to check vision. There are seven, eight of these things. It just makes it interesting, just catch the attention of the kids. So uh, now, why are we even checking vision? Why, like I said, sometimes it takes many times. Why are we doing all of this? Because there are two important visually critical periods in the development of the human eye. One is the early um, visual development, where if a child is born with or has a vision issue in the first few weeks of life, then what is our safe period? And second is, as the child is growing and he has some problems, again, what is our second window of safety till when we can reverse vision? So I want to talk about two areas of critical vision development. Let's talk about the newborns. If a child is born with both eyes having an issue, like a bilateral cataract or a bilateral retinal issue or a bilateral glaucoma, then I have somewhere till three months of life to deal with this before deep amblyopia sets in. What is the meaning of deep amblyopia? whereby the eye-brain connection is not developing enough to ever recover vision. Which means if I do the cataract at six months of age, by then the child has developed nystagmus and deep amblyopia. So doing surgery is only doing very little. So if a child is born with a cataract, I should probably, if it's a bilateral, I should probably do it in the first one or two months of life, maximum till three. And if I have a one eye problem, then uh, my time period becomes even less, that is six weeks. So all this is vision issues. If I had to talk about binocular vision, which comes from a squint, or misalignment of the eyes, where vision is not so much of an issue, it's just the muscle balance. I think we spoke earlier that up to six months is when I will react. So this is the early. And the second one, where over time, if the child has developed a number in one eye, or has had an injury, a little bit of corneal issue, something else happening, giving rise to a lazy eye. Then I have up to age six or seven years to take care of it. Now, example being, one eye 
has no number. The other eye has a cylindrical number of four. Now, the cylindrical number eye is the lazy eye. It's not working as well. But you can't tell from outside until you check, right? So I have till about six or seven years, up to age six or seven years, I can put the child into glasses and do good patching and bring the vision back to as much as the right eye or as much as normal with the glasses on. Now, what will happen if I don't correct it? Yes, I can still put the child into glasses at age 10 when I find that problem. Yes, I will still try to patch, but it won't be as effective. So he may recover some vision, but not all. So really when we uh, talk about amblyopia and when we tell our parents, we, we kind of tell them that this is your best time to recover good vision, close to normal vision, so please help us. Coming to how do we deal with amblyopia? The commonest amblyopia is coming from refractive errors. So how do we deal with this? First, put the child into correct glasses. And second is patch or cover the good eye for sometimes an hour or two a day to sometimes six to eight hours a day. What does it depend on? It depends on the degree of amblyopia. So it's a very, and there are guidelines given for all kinds of amblyopia but by and large it comes from patching from one to two hours a day to six to eight hours a day so i just wanted you to know that these are guidelines for treating amblyopia a lot of medications like levodopa cetacoline other things have been tried but have not stood the test of time the gold standard is correct the problem, correct the refractive error, give that eye a chance to work harder, which means patch the other eye, allow this eye to be used and let it recover. Okay. So this is how I would treat amblyopia. Coming to now the strabismus or the squint problems. I think we all know that an inward squint is an esotropia and outward is an exo and then there is a vertical component as well. Again, I will give the very broad guidelines of squint correction. Actually, this slide does not show option one. Sorry about that. Option one is do nothing for intermittent squints and I will just come to that. Second is glasses, third is exercises, and fourth is surgery. Not necessarily in that order, but world over, these are the four ways to treat a squint. Depends on the type of squint, the age of the child, the kind of refractive error, and multiple factors. It's a case-to-case -case based decision. Some common situations are like this. If you see this child, she's about four, four and a half years old. She developed a squint, inward deviation of the squint over the last few months. And she has a hypermetropic astigmatism. Glasses alone are controlling the squint. There is nothing else to do. What classically happens to children like this? Usually after 10 or 12 years of age, we are able to wean the glasses off slowly. The glasses go away, the squint goes away. There's no surgery required for some kind of squint, one being the accommodative esotopia. Here is another child who has an intermittent outward deviation, which means most of the time the eyes are straight functioning well. Once in a while when the child is tired or anxious or 
something else, the eye, one eye drips a little bit. Usually this variety of squint is where we don't get very aggressive on treatment. If vision is equal in both eyes and they are maintaining depth perception. Now, the whole idea of treating a squint is to get the eyes to see well and work together. Work together is uh, allow 3D viewing or maintain muscle balance such that you have stereopsis. So if stereopsis is maintained and the vision is good, I wouldn't do anything to an intermittent exotropia, just watch. Coming to cases where it's an early onset squint, like a congenital esotrope. Yes, in those cases, we would get uh, more aggressive and correct early. This child was operated at six months of age as early as six to seven months of age. If it is not a congenital squint, we can wait till the child is older. These are just some examples, just showing you some photographs of how children do um, regain binocular vision after surgery. This child had a left inward squint. This is a year or two after surgery is doing well. This is another child. Okay, so that kind of gives us an overview of different kinds of squints that we see and how we go about managing them. So I think we've covered why we need to look into pediatric ophthalmology. Um, how we assess vision in our clinics, why we assess vision, what is our critical period, what uh, are the different kinds of squints we see and how we follow them. Um, I'm going to ask one question, which okay. I think I wanted an opinion from the audience. Okay. When do you refer apparently healthy children for eye checkup? What I, I put it in inverted comma, as in a routine eye checkup. To an ophthalmologist, whether if you have facility for Dr. Neva and pediatric ophthalmologist, fine, or any other ophthalmologist. Dr. Nipa. Okay. So I am going to um, share. You can address it whenever whenever you want to address it in your course of yeah, the, yes. the talk. My, yeah. Okay. But I'm going to share the guidelines given by various organizations. But it began with uh, the American Association of Pediatrics and the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology. They are the first ones to give these guidelines and if I know correctly, these are also the guidelines now accepted by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. So uh, we're, we're just going to go through these guidelines now. Is when should vision screening be done in children? So uh, three important uh, areas or time periods where vision assessment is done is for all newborns before they go home in the nursery or wherever that they are at that time what do you see at that time you only see uh, the external surface of the eye with a torch light you assess the overall eye health which means is the lid complete does the cornea look clear is the pupil round and I think now we are also tilting towards training our young ones to see the red reflex. So that's one thing before the child goes home, any normal newborn before they go home, just a quick torch reflex, a torch light exam and a red reflex, which takes less than one minute. 
then the second test is when they come to you for their bell baby examination or some vaccine which is between 6 to 9 months of age again the same thing is to be seen and maybe a, add a question or two about the visual milestones that we spoke about earlier and then the first formal vision screening with a little bit uh, more um, emphasis on ocular alignment to be done between three and three and a half years of age. Now I want to uh, re-emphasize this versus the answer that we got about uh, red flags or symptoms or complaints. The reason I want to say this is remember the slide when I said my crucial period is six to seven years. So if the child and most of the children do not complain till six or seven years of age because that's when they even start going to first standard. Everything is so new. By the time they start complaining or the parents start picking something up, the child is already in second or third grade. So that's a little bit way uh, more than my six to seven years. Also, 25% are going to have one eye normal and they're going to function normally for the rest of their life. It's the other eye which is not as good. So if I do not pick it up well before six years, that is why the three to three and a half years where I have enough time to then put the child into glasses and treat the amblyopia before six years. So that's how this criteria has been made. Now, uh, whether you have access to a pediatric ophthalmologist or not, over time, and uh, Maniar sir and the seniors, maybe, uh, I don't know what you all think, but is a vision chart in your clinic a possibility? So that's one. Many people are moving towards checking vision in the pediatrician's office. Or, of course, in India, we have a lot of ophthalmologists and it's easy to refer. These are countries where referral is an issue. I think a vision chart is being put up in many pediatric uh, centers as well. But uh, irrespective of who does it, three to three and a half years, sometimes four years is when I would do my first complete eye exam. And by then, most children are able to give us a, a decent response. So uh, coming back to what is it that you, I mean, most of uh, the responses are when there are complaints. So probably you know this slide more than me, but I'll still go through it with you. There could be multiple causes of headaches. More uh, common uh, would be non-ocular causes in an OPD like yours with cough, cold, sinus, I don't know what else. But uh, each uh, child with headaches, which doesn't fit into your regular thing, I would do an eye test. Sometimes dizziness, eye strain, definitely double vision. If there are complaints of not being able to read beyond a particular point, not able to cope in school, then if you hear those kind of things from parents, then probably an eye test is warranted. What about older children? If you see a child holding, or if you or the parent actually sees the child holding a book, or an object unusually close. Sometimes a kid is playing in your clinic, there's a toy and he just brings it closer to see. That'll probably give you a clue. Um, eye rubbing, even though suggests allergies until proved otherwise, but some children do not know how to you know, express the vision issues and there are episodes of eye itching. Of course, if there is a squint, you guys will pick it up in the clinic. Excessive blinking. These problems are more obvious. They are bumping into things or that's very obvious. Uh, another common complaint is the parents say the child looks at the TV like this. The child turns his face just a little bit to look at the TV. The most common cause of this is astigmatism or cylindrical numbers. And then there are other clues of um, poor hand-eye coordination, sometimes reduced vision, sometimes not, can't really tell. 
any pain redness some uh, some signs of uh, having vision issues in the dark the vitamin a deficiency and stuff like that so many 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 areas where you could think of where an eye test but these are just the common ones coming now to an interesting topic very um, common situation everybody knows about refractive errors uh, many of us also wear glasses but i just want to point out some um, interesting uh, stuff that we are seeing over time i think we all know that there are three kinds of refractive errors myopia um, minus numbers hypermetropia plus numbers and astigmatism cylindrical numbers most children and definitely most indian children are hypermetropic when they are younger or when they are born and as they grow the first few years the hypermetropia reduces they come to emetropia which is no numbers and then unfortunately we are seeing an increasing trend of myopia even in india we thought that um, initially myopia was restricted to some other countries but we are seeing a lot and that's quite worrisome actually so there are um, um some uh, so the whole world is now uh, because the myopia quotient of the whole world is increasing there is a lot of uh, research on myopia and some very interesting stuff coming out of that so i'll let dr maniar ask a question on myopia yeah i think i already asked and they have responded so i'll just share the results so you could go ahead and tell us some interesting points on this medication okay so answer is most people think no okay so yeah so we'll talk about that so different kinds of things have been tried for myopia i will go through them with you special kind of lenses which means the refractive index of the lens changes from the top to the bottom something like progressive lenses that the adults wear were tried didn't work there was a special kind of glass made by a company called zeiss where there was defocus in the periphery and focus only in the center didn't work multiple medications vitamin d what not tried for myopia didn't work the only thing that we are seeing which has stood the test of time is a agent used in the form of eye drops it's called atropin and everybody has heard of atropin used it in very varied situations we as ophthalmologists use it for pupillary dilation study originated in singapore where they started using atropin 1% eye drops for progressive myopia i want to emphasize on progressive myopia which means if i find a child with minus 2 today i am not justified to start the child on atropin eye drops i have to see if he is progressing how much is the progression there are criteria for all of this if there is a strong family history he is an indoor person reads a lot not exposed too much to outdoors myopia is increasing by minus 1 every 6 months and only progressing then the option of putting him on atropin eye drops has been tried for the last 10 years this study has been going on 1% atropin is what they started with children started showing not side effects effects of atropin which means pupillary dilation a lot of glare slowly the concentration of atropin was brought down now we are at a 0.01% atropin which has no ocular effects which means there is no pupillary dilation there is no uh, reading difficulty but it seems to be we have 
about a five, a four to five year data, and there is definitely a 60% of children who are showing a slowing or a plateauing of myopia progression. So I think this is an excellent result from the various uh, therapies that we have for myopia. Of course, it should be done very um, scientifically. Measurement of the axial length of the eyeball should be taken every year. But this is the most promising um, thing that we have for myopia. So I just thought I'll share this with you. If um, your patients are asking you and if there is ever any discussion on what is the kind of glasses children should wear, I just thought I should go through this with you. The lenses in the frames should always be plastic. There is no role for glass anymore. Anyway, nobody even gives glass opticals unless we write it and only numbers of 20 or more um, need the glass glass lenses, not otherwise. So it always is plastic. There are wonderful frames, colors, sizes, fits available in the market for a child as less as six months. So really getting glasses is not an issue. Should you have anti-reflection coating on the glasses? My answer is no. Because if your child wears glasses, doesn't mean that he doesn't get enough sun. His eyes are otherwise normal. So if your child didn't wear glasses, he was not going to go around wearing anti-reflection glasses in the first place, right? So my answer is always no. Are there any scratch-proof glasses? Many companies advertise it, but there is unfortunately nothing like that. Try it yourself. Buy any scratch-proof, give it to a child, and you'll see what happens. Okay, coming to the next very, very important um, uh, subject is retinopathy of prematurity. I'm sure all of you all deal with uh, the very uh, young and premature children. Uh, the guidelines, um, India is actually now evolving uh, as a center, the number of premature children surviving are obviously increasing thanks to your management. And that's why India is evolving uh, as a center for its own guidelines because they are studying the kind of children we have and uh, how our uh, NICUs are looking after and we formed our own guidelines. So uh, I just thought I'll share at least the guidelines with you broadly and what are the two forms of treatment that are available right now. So there are two scenarios here. One is gestational age less than 34 weeks, 34 weeks or less, and birth weight two kgs or less. The first screening should be done by one month of age, the 30 day rule it's called, before 30 days. Now, uh, really if there are associated high risk factors like sepsis and intraventricular hemorrhage, I think there is a big list, you guys know more than me, then maybe a little sooner, maybe a week sooner. So maybe 21 uh, days on to 30 days. But if the child is very premature, and birth weight is very less than maybe earlier. So uh, now uh, the 30 day rule, which was the golden rule has shifted down. Really the ROP screening for the very small ones and the very low birth weight should start before 30 days. Otherwise the average is 30 days. Um, this is again a preventable cause of blindness. Yes, there are a group of children who just progress so fast and so relentlessly that you could still lose vision, but by and large, it's a preventable condition. Now, really, there are two uh, forms of treatment. Till about a few years back, we had only one 
which was laser, laser, and laser, the avascular retina, or laser the area which has stopped growing. Basically, that's what it means. The avascular retina is this area here where the blood vessels have just stopped here. They're just not going ahead. So we would just laser off this area. But now there is an addition of a medication which is an anti-VEGF, which is an anti uh, VEGF. It's in the form of an inj intraocular injection. It is given right there into the baby's eyes. And it's a vascular endothelial, it's an anti-vascular endothelial growth factor. Now, initially, when the anti-VEGF was introduced, some people were giving anti-VEGF and some people were doing laser. And then there was a big mismatch between if you called a person A to do your ROP screening, they decided, oh, laser was a better uh, mode of treatment or somebody. But now the guideline, both have its places. If it is a more aggressive um, ROP, then the first thing probably to do is to give an anti-VEGF and then combine it with laser. So till a few years back, there was a little bit of overlap as this new treatment was introduced. But now the guidelines for when to give an anti-VEGF, at which stage and when to do laser are pretty clear. So I just wanted to discuss this because sometimes you would have come across two different kind of ophthalmologists who one would say give this and one would say, but now it's all, uh, India has laid down its own guidelines. So uh, back to, uh, please keep the um, birth weight and uh, the gestational age in mind and uh, have an eye test done accordingly. Coming to the next topic, um, screen time for children, which is creating so much havoc now that there is lockdown. I'm going to divide this slide into pre-lockdown and post-lockdown because really the recommendations for screen time after having done multiple years of research, people have put this up, research not just for this, uh, figures that I'm giving you are for the eye, but of course multiple areas have been studied of why screen time should not be a lot. So really the recommendation was that if a child is less than two years, there should be no screen time. Between two and five, 30 minutes, between five and 10, an hour. And I intentionally didn't put the fourth figure. Teenagers, I don't know, they are scary. But after the lockdown, screen time has gone up by hours and hours and hours. And what we are recommending is really I'll just go through the four or five points because I'm sure your patients will be asking you this every day, is take frequent breaks. The 20-20 rule means every 20 minutes, get up from your screen site, take a walk, do something else for at least 20 to 30 seconds. Try and use the computer in a well-lit room Try to use larger screens, not smaller ones. So if a child has to have view something, the TV is better than the laptop, which is better than the mobile phone. Try and place the device at or slightly lower than the eye level. And most of the working should be done in daylight versus nighttime. Lens cart and other uh, fancy uh, opticals are selling uh, blue cut glasses. Um, everybody asks me that question, at least different people, school groups. And our recommendation is it is not needed. Most of the electronic devices in the last five to 10 years actually have come up with inbuilt UV screens. 
they are protected by itself the blue cut glasses do nothing there is no scientific evidence that it works to reduce eye strain or not develop a refractive error because of screens so we are not recommending it at all coming to when should you refer sooner than later so any kind of injury especially the first picture here on my right is just showing a little clot actually no big deal but sometimes if you look at the eye here it looks absolutely okay and really in your clinic you can have the child cover the other eye and read with the injured eye and really if vision is okay everything is okay i mean one more trip to an ophthalmologist who will dilate this child and make him wait with an injured eye for an hour is sometimes you feel like it looks all okay but no i would definitely recommend because sometimes there could be injury to the back of the eye with the blow or whatever else that has hit the eye enough to cause an hemorrhage and so i would definitely recommend any kind of injury however uh, insignificant it be the other common thing that we see is if you see this line here we fluorescein stained the cornea now this injury was very insignificant but there is a corneal uh, little abrasion here if i would leave it there is a small chance that it could get infected so any kind of injury is when i would think that a child should be seen of course if there is sudden loss of vision any acute squint because we found that uh, acute squints are sometimes associated with intracranial lesions headaches with or without systemic associations and of course a foreign body in the eye if there is a history of something going into the eye and the patient feeling that discomfort the foreign bodies are classically known to dislodge in areas where sometimes you would have to evert or double evert and find it so at least these is i'm thinking that the children should be referred sooner than later and then there is a whole list of things which i thought we'll discuss these are common questions asked by the parents maybe they ask you as well but they definitely ask us i think we are um, but if you have any suggestions or if you think differently we can talk about it i think we all agree that kajal has no role in keeping the eyes healthy but we have still asked this many many times second is does my child need sunglasses so then i ask a question really that and it's like this many parents use sunglasses each time they go out actually so i always ask this that do you all do regular trips outside and is there a lot of outdoor sunlit hours that are there for a child because otherwise i usually like to say no there is really no need for a child to wear sunglasses sitting in a car going from dadar to andheri so you know stuff like that so i am definitely not recommending it more so because the sunglasses which are available in the malls or have no certified i mean they are not up to the mark it sometimes gives a, a false sense of security that i'm wearing sunglasses and they're looking they're just not up to the mark so i am not in favor of those then there are a group of children who have significant refractive errors and they are swimmers so earlier days there were no swim glasses available with numbers usually children with minus 4 or more find it difficult to swim without numbered swimming goggles and i want to say that now they are easily available not just in fancy sports shops but also in optical outlets the same is for sports a material called as polycarbonate lenses are made for contact sports they make the glasses sturdier 
and that's why I reduce the impact if the child is into contact sports. So yes, for high numbers, as it is when the eye is more susceptible to, um, say, a child as minus six, minus seven, and uh, as it is, the chances of retinal detachment and other things are higher with injury in those children. Uh, I probably make an effort to at least put it forth to the parents that they should make sports glasses. Um, I think we discussed the blue light glasses for screens. Um, coming to um, eye yoga. Now there are a few centers in Bombay who are claiming that eye yoga helps in taking away the numbers or reducing them. Yes, there is some reduction in the eye number with yoga to the magnitude of minus 0.25 or minus 0.5, where the children do eye exercises for three, three, four, four hours a day for three to four months, and they get a reduction of minus 0.25. A week after they stop, you're back to square one. So in 16 years of doing pediatric ophthalmology, I've not seen a single child have any benefit from eye yoga for their numbers. It does not work. In fact, if there is a combination of numbers and a squint, the eye yoga centers mess up the eye muscle balance and the squint I've seen get worse because they don't know what they are doing with the eye muscle. So it's very, very unfortunate as a as a lobby from the PDI, from the ophthalmology society we have written to them many times saying that don't mislead the people but it's not working yet do you really need to wash your eyes every day with water the answer is no the tear film in the eye gives enough lubrication to remove whatever it needs to remove from the eye. So really not recommended that every morning you get up and you wash your eyes, no. What about reading? Many of the children now are good readers and uh, the question is, is Kindle um, a good option? And what is the background lighting? So. I'll answer these two questions together since these are good reading habits. One is most of the reading should be done in daylight with uh, enough light, natural light coming in versus artificial light. If it has to be artificial light, it has to be white light, not dim light or not yellow dim light. And really for good readers who read a book a day or more, it's obviously a good option to give in to the Kindle. But with varying changes in the Kindle background, natural light, this light, that light, whatever that the Kindle manufacturers have come up with, I still prefer hard copy books. I understand that books buying books, keeping them, the wood which goes into making them, the cost, everything else. But especially for myopic children who are doing excessive near work, I do not recommend the Kindle. Or if they have to, it would be 20 or 30% of their reading hours, not more than that. So these are some very common questions that we are asked in the clinic. If you, uh, any of you are asked any other questions and you think we should discuss it, maybe if sir gave us some time, we can do it now. Yeah, doctor. So even at the end of your talk, uh, uh, we will, there are a few questions that we can address and we have a chat box on which uh, all of you can put your questions through and Dr. Nipa will be happy to answer that. Okay. So I had kind of... Uh, timed it like this because I had till four. This is perfect. So if you want to shoot the questions or so, if have any other topic that you think I should cover, then I'm happy to. So one of the question is how long should a, should patching usually is done? Okay, good question. So um, patching to be continued 
still vision in the amblyopic or the lazy eye comes to as much as the other eye or normal now i think the other thing the question that you're asking is how long does it take on an average right on an average it takes between 6 months to a year sometimes longer i'll i'll answer i will uh, bring up one more point even though i said 6 to 7 years if i had a 8 year old child or a 9 year old child who i found to be amblyopic would i still patch answer is yes i would patch till age 10 so even though i know it may not give the best results but whatever i got is mine so one more question regarding uh, amblyopia what is usually the difference in the refractive power of between the two eyes that would lead to amblyopia uh difference of two how many power huh? two to two and a half yeah so if one eye was 3 and the other was 6 or if one eye was 0 and the other one was 2.5 a difference between the two of 2 or 2 and a half can you talk uh, give us some more details about neonatal checkup for red reflex dr bakebiar agarwal wants to okay so um there is an oft- there is a um, instrument called as ophthalmoscope which can come in as much as it's like a torch light it's a direct ophthalmoscope and it just needs a little bit of training for everybody to look through that into the pupillary area the mechanics of the eye are such that when you shine a light and it reflects back from the retina what you see there is a orange red reflex and that kind of takes you through the whole path the light is going through the cornea through the lens into the vitreous touching the retina reflected back through the same path so if there is any obstacle in that whole path the reflex will not look red the reflex will not look orange red so but it needs a little bit of training to but it's like your i don't know if you carry a otoscope or a hammer or whatever it just it's a little pocket of thermoscope and maybe we should all train to look for the red reflex so you have tried to avoid uh, this particular statement how much a teenager should use the my screen my teenager is sitting in front of me and i would love to say <laughs> 30 minutes no so right. okay, let's no, be they... fair let's be fair to them i think 2 hours with broken 1 to 2 hour with broken it should not be a continuous 2 hours uh some more information on role of atropine for progressive myopia whether it is daily weekly what kind of uh, things that yeah, you so the protocol is one drop each night we prefer that it's put at night just before the child goes to sleep one drop in each eye the really the effect of whether the atropine is going to work for you as as, as your child we would know after a year so at least for a year you have to show that commitment that you will put one drop in each eye sometimes when it doesn't work after a year you still see um some progression you have two choices the safer choice is to put it twice a day or then to increase the concentration from 0.01 to make it 0.03 0.05 so those are various options uh, in the indian eyes because we have relatively darker eyes increasing the concentration is working better than just increasing the dosage now i would uh, continue atropine for at least 2 to 3 years depending on the age and the refractive error for a minus 6 i would continue till the child has attained some decent height growth disease in rop and uh, sorry ma'am no no please go ahead yeah so i would continue for some years now fortunately for the last 2 years we are getting 
atropin in india made by indian companies for 230 rupees the bottle lasts for a month about 3 4 years back our parents who were keen were actually buying these drops from singapore for a cost so fortunately now everything is there. so it's now, not sir you have two queries can you ask them please and rajesh also can, wants to ask i've just written down you can ask but there's yeah. no so, uh, Saurasar wants to know, uh, AAP recommends ROP screening for less than 28 weeks at 32 weeks. Why do we recommend it earlier in India? So, they are recommended four weeks afterwards and we are recommending earlier. Why do you, what is the reason I mean, for that? Yes. So, sir, we are seeing there is something called as plus disease and aggressive ROP. We are seeing that more and more in our children. Uh, so we don't want to miss that actually. We've there there have been different uh, regions are showing the plus disease to be coming up. The plus disease is a more uh, aggressive. Acha, you're asking me why? I see the systemic factors probably play a role. So I'm I'm not. Uh, but we are seeing this pattern. Uh, so we don't want to miss it. We want to do it, catch it early and uh, probably be more aggressive on treatment. And do you recommend anti-VGF uh, for zone 2 disease in ROP? Zone 2. So, sir, it has to be, yeah. So, there is a combination of zones, stage, and if there is any retinal detachment. So, uh, what is the stage? So, if it is stage 3, zone 2, with more than five clock hours involved, maybe yes. So there are multiple factors, sir. I can share the um, chart with you of where it should be used, and that would I will share it with Dr. Maniar and sure. If, if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, this contiguous uh, eye clock was used in older time uh, when they used to call threshold disease and all. Yes, sir. Now, with ETROP 1 and 2, that contiguity is not under consideration. Yes, sir. But if it's a lot of clock hours, you see a lot of disease, then you would want to give anti-VEGF as well. I will share the criteria with you yeah. in the diagrams. So that we can... and if the baby is to be discharged earlier than four weeks, so he's around 32, 34 weeks, hmm. then can we do at the time of discharge the screening or? Yes. Yes, I think that is what we are doing now. We are at least seeing them once to know what the retina looks like and then calling them back based on. Yes, sir. Answer is yes. Rajesh? What is the mechanism of action of atropine in progressive myopia? I'm sorry if you've already mentioned and I'm. I haven't because the uh, answer is uh, I don't know. No, that's not true. There are many theories. Um, as to why, what it does. First, there was uh, that it changes the accommodation. Second is it was causes, causing some pull on the ciliary muscle, preventing axial length growth. And now they are saying that there are some S receptors on the uh, subscleral area for the peripheral retina on which it is acting. Um, the answer or the real answer is going to be, unfortunately, sir, when we have enough um, eyes yeah. to dissect in people who have used atropin. Oh. So, don't know. What, what message, doctor, would you like to give for online learning in lockdown or post-lockdown, whatever? So, so, in other words, uh, when we say screen time, a large amount of screen time, much more than the time allotted, is sometimes for a so-called educational activity. So how do we cater to that? So my uh, request to, one is uh, to the schools or the educational institutions would be that uh, really the younger ones, less than 10 years, should not be put through this long hours of really should not be the uh, preschoolers are having two to three three hours of online class what sense does that make book learning uh, 
even though i am a working parent book learning for the younger children one hour a day should be something that i would recommend urge the schools to do really the pre primaries and all should not be put through it if at all half an hour one hour of some basic learning and then the parents to take over if it is older children then uh, some schools and i found the difference between this so i'm easily saying this some schools upload uh, those uh, lecture series and then leave it on for a week and the child is at liberty to view them when they can so i think that is better because that allows that child to take frequent long breaks between uh, versus just getting ready in a school uniform and sitting there from 9 to 1 that is what some schools are doing they are making those children dress up in uniforms and sit there it's monitored so that is something that i'm definitely not uh, for it i i'm happier if they send those three videos and let the child view it during the week how so, should one uh, monitor long term watering of eyes epiphora in infancy how should one how should one manage okay so the commonest cause of uh, epiphora in the really little infants is nas- probably nasolacrimal duct obstruction is is that something that you are talking okay that's right yeah, yeah. and so, of course they have also asked about discharges from eye but yeah. i thought those are two different areas that we are talking about plain no. just watering or watering and or discharge so i think both categories could come into the nasolacrimal duct obstruction the grade of the nasolacrimal duct obstruction probably matters if it is a complete block of the nasolacrimal duct which opens into the middle meatus of the nose the tears which just collect in the sac stagnate get infected and come out as discharge there is partial block or frequent massaging which means the tears that are collecting in the sac are not stagnating then it just comes out as clear water so i would do massage massage and massage the lacrimal massage i would teach the parents i can probably show it on this the area between the nose bridge and the eye here is where the sac is of course it has to be a better well cut nail than mine and i'd go around there press the sac enough to decompress it even when i press the sac some uh, tears or fluid will come out and i'd go down towards the nose so i'd probably do some circular motion and down towards the nose and i would call this nasolacrimal massage i would teach the parents to do nasolacrimal massage i would have them do it every hour of their waking hours i don't want them to get up every hour in the night and do massage so basically 10 to 12 times a day for at least the first 6 months and unless the tearing stops before that what is your usual work up for cataract in older children okay so then that is two areas to cataract uh, evaluation one is for anesthesia assessment because of the surgical viewpoint and then is um, referral back to you to understand if there is an associated systemic condition some areas in where uh, some uh, places where i work there is a, a significant association with torch infections so ruling out torch in the baby in the mother is one thing other nutritional issue so one is a systemic evaluation and second is preparedness for anesthesia those two things of course local investigation size of the eye if a lens needs to be put what kind of lens measurement all that is a different ball game what can we do for dryness that one feels in eyes after working for long hours on laptop okay so yes there are lubricating eye drops which are nothing but artificial tears or wetting drops uh, 
they can be used i am a little conservative about using them in young children so i'd rather say no screen time but for people like us who are adults and long hours first option would always be to do frequent breaks but if not then any lubricating refresh tears or gentle or just tears or artificial tears or any tears is okay uh one question was there regarding mycotic infection in newborns i don't know whether you have the time to cover prevention identification and treatment of mycotic infection of eye especially preterm or during the stay in nicu mycotic ocular infections in a newborn yeah okay so it's not about time i'm just going to say uh, i don't know i don't see it as often Yeah, that's what you want. Yeah, I don't. Sir, sir. No. So, do you see it as often, sir? I mean, do you have any experience? No, no, no. Not even no. I was, I'm not sure what, what exactly. Okay, one more question is which type of glasses? I think you have answered that, but I'll still ask it all the same. Which type of glasses we can use if we have to spend more time on laptop, mobile? As in lockdown, children have to spend five to six hours for study. So, no special glasses. No. Uh, fancy glasses not needed and some comment on approach to red eyes i know it's a talk by itself but all the same okay so i'll know i'll, I'll answer that the two uh, two most common conditions where um, who present to the clinic for us with a red eye and in that order are allergies first and infections second right for uh, fortunately i'm going to say allergies are more common than infections infections can be nasty sometimes and allergies may be um, nagging and irritating they keep coming back again and again but uh, as long as they don't involve the cornea they don't really affect vision so in that order allergies and then infections is what comes red flags for the red eyes i'm sorry i'm obsessed with red flags yes no that's fine any um, any uh, lacrimation any tearing out of proportion to the amount of redness that you see lot of tearing but a pink eye not so much red lot of photophobia inability to open that eye all that would think that i would think that there's something else happening either there is a corneal involvement or a pressure issue and something is not right uh, no just a red eye little bit of discomfort watering discharge i would let that pass but lots of lubricate lots of tearing just so much that not able to even look up even a torch light examination is difficult and i would think something is different yeah that's all from my side sawar sir rajesh no. anything you want to ask i think we had a wonderful presentation thank you sir i will uh, do the rop i will send it to maniar sir thank you thank you so much dr nepa